Shoes are on. I'll show you. Right here. Shoes are on. Bam. Pretty easy, right? So anyway, I wear them all the time. My wife Leslie wears them all the time. I didn't know they'd have a booth here. Um, not sponsored. Not sponsored at all, but these are my favorite shoes that I wear when I want my feet to be comfortable when I have to walk a long way, whether it's on the golf course or at a convention hall like this. So yeah, that's uh, Kizik. And they're a Utah company, which is pretty cool. All kinds of brand activations here, a lot of different companies that you wouldn't expect to be at CES. This one is the Delta and Starbucks collaboration. It's like an activation where you link the two accounts and then when you buy things at Starbucks, you get points on your Delta. But anyway, they have this really cool wall with like a Delta. I got an email from CES saying, because you're a digital content creator, you get the creator gift. The creator gift was a t-shirt, and um, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but I've got enough t-shirts with people's logos on them. I don't need it, so I was a little disappointed, but I am a million miler with Delta, so I love it. I'm pretty confident that this guy does not see us beyond this glass right here. He's in some sort of VR world right now. He's touring the Alps, uses his hands to control things. Imagine this is intentional, but uh, this booth called Rolo says, stop going to the post office and then look at the booth right next door. It's this one called uh, the post office. <laughs> one thing you can always count on with CES is that LG is going to be here, that they're going to have the biggest booth and that they're going to have some sick LG OLED TVs. And man, let me look at these ones. Every year, all the awards. World's first wireless OLED, apparently that's what's going on. And they always seem to have like a giant wall of OLED TVs. It's been like, I don't know, 10 years? We went to Iceland 10 years ago with LG and we saw all of the OLED TVs. That was the first time I'd seen it. Whenever friends call me and ask me about TVs, I'm always like, gotta go with OLED, gotta go with the LG TV. So yeah, they're not sponsoring me being at their booth. Hey, what's up? I made it to CES 2023 and there's so much amazing tech that I can't wait to show you. We have a lot to see, so sit back, relax, and let's check it out. Robot lawnmowers are kind of getting crazy and this one from EcoFlow really stood out. You can actually attach a bag on the back to sweep or collect leaves in your yard. Imagine driving through your neighborhood and seeing this thing doing yard work. It has an app so you can control it and set virtual boundaries plus some sensors in the front to avoid obstacles. It even has 4G and an eSIM built in if it gets out of Wi-Fi range. Mowing the lawn could actually be fun with the EcoFlow blade. I mean, a robot chopping things with a blade in front of your house, what could go wrong? So you've heard of smoke detectors, but what about fire detectors? This new product immediately detects a small flame, then notifies you with a push notification and an alarm beeping. <laughs> They say this is perfect for a kid's room, so if you have a pyromaniac who plays with matches, well, you should probably hide those matches and then get this. This surprised me and is one of my favorite things from CES. It's just so fast and accurate. But what about the kitchen? Well, the pro version has a PIR and radar sensor built in to detect if someone is in the room. Then it can alert you if you left your gas stove on and no one is in the room anymore. Pretty sweet. Ring's new car cam actually has two cameras, one looking inside and one facing forward. There is a privacy shutter to block the inside camera that will mute the microphone. But if we had this, it would settle a lot of debates about which kid hit first. It starts recording from motion if you're not in the car or tell it to record with a voice Crank your engine! 
October 2021, we held a first of its kind competition. Nine university teams competing with autonomous race cars at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We set world records with cars reaching 160 miles an hour, driven all by robotic algorithms developed by these university teams. It pushed the technology behind autonomous driving to the absolute edge. But as proud as we were of that day, there was still this nagging feeling of something more that we needed to show the world. From the beginning, we've always had the goal of head-to-head -head racing. Head-to-head -head racing is incredibly important. If we're ever going to have autonomous vehicles operating on the highway, there's not going to be one at a time. They're going to have to encounter one another. And so the autonomous challenge is two teams on the track at the same time, passing each other at increasingly higher and higher speeds. This is hard. Multiple vehicles that are operating totally independent of one another, having to navigate and make decisions without knowing what the other vehicle is going to do. This passing competition pushes our teams and their coding to the next level. It's showcasing that the technology is ready to do real-world decision-making the way a driver would on a highway. These teams realize that this is an opportunity to push the technology further for saving lives, for improving the world, and to be part of something that will shape the future of autonomous mobility. I almost felt out of place walking around CES with just my normal eyes. This headset called MewTalk is a soundproof Bluetooth microphone. It's designed to muffle your screams, and I wish this was a joke, but this is really what it's for. Since gaming and the metaverse can apparently get intense, this stops you from annoying people stuck in reality. Just don't get hurt in real life because no one will hear your cries for help. Really though, I could barely hear any noise coming from the shouting person demoing this. No! <laughs> but I still can't get past how strange it looks. Nanoleaf announced Nala at CES. No, not her. It stands for Nanoleaf Automation's Learning Assistant. Basically, it learns your routines, then automates your lights. If you always dim the lights or change the colors at a certain time, eventually it will do it for you. Nala is a feature in Nanoleaf's new Sense Plus switches. These switches also have a motion sensor and ambient light sensor built in, which they hid pretty well. The thing that literally sticks out the most is the scroll wheel to dim the lights. It's definitely easy to use, but only if you can get your spouse on board with the design. LG's booth is always intense. They had this expansion. Our Gaffney High School speaker this morning is Dr. Cynthia Valentine Sutherland. Cynthia is a 1997 graduate of Gaffney High School. Cynthia is a multi-award winning global cybersecurity leader with 25 years of IT experience and 17 years of cybersecurity experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Cynthia Valentine. Hello? Good? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Heisen, for having me over. I really appreciate it. Um, this is always a highlight for me every year when I get a chance to come talk to, little kid, to, to younger adults. I'll just say that much. Um, so let's see. What am I actually going to talk about? Now, some, I know uh, when I typically do these conversations, um, the main thing that kids want to know about is how much money do I make in my job? That's what most of them want to know. But 
the issue with that is that you want to know how much money I make, but understanding that I'm not giving you any of my money. So then the question should be is, how did I get to a point where I'm making the money that I do make? So with that being said, I'll talk about how I graduated from Gaffney High class in 1997. Um, I went to Limestone College and got my degree in computer science. I then went and got my master's degree at Capital Technology, got me a doctorate in cybersecurity. And now when I left Gaffney High, this career did not exist. And the only reason why it exists now is because of technology. Now who in here knows what cybersecurity is? Couple, come on, raise your hands. I want to see who in here knows. No one knows what cybersecurity is? Huh? Come on. So cybersecurity is basically taking technology and making sure that it operates the way it's supposed to, period. Making sure that nobody can hack into it, making sure that if people did hack into it, we'd be able to see what happened. So that's basically, in general, what cybersecurity is. Now, I've been in IT now for 25 years, and I've been out of high school for 26. And how did I get into I IT? Well, it was at Gaffney High. It was my computer class. They taught us um, basic keyboarding and how to use pieces of software. And when I left Gaffney High, I was able to get a job using the skills and the knowledge that I learned here. So this was huge for me back in the day because coming out of high school, you know, you, you kind of worry about, well, should I go to college or should I get a job? So those are conversations that, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go into. Now, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, how much money do you guys actually want to make? Now, I want you to think about it. Think about how much money do you want to make per year? So what I want you to do is I want you to look at this slide. Think about what is the amount of money you want to make. And I want you to identify the level associated with that money, that, that, that amount of money. Now, take some time, think about it. Everybody has their number? Everybody got their number? OK. So this is your goal. I don't want you to tell anybody what your number is. I want you to keep it to yourself. But this is your goal. Now, you have, your, you have your goal and you have your level on what you're going to do. Now, if you have a goal, what is the first place we start? At start, right? We start where we are trying to get to that goal, that amount of money that you want to make. Now, let's see how we actually should start. Line up. Everybody line up. We're about to race. Everybody line up. Shoulder to shoulder. Take off your backpack. Basketball. Line up. We're about to race. Hey, we are we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. The winner of this race will take this. A hundred dollar bill. Before I say go. I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward. If you grew up with a father figure quiet, in the kinda, home. Just pay attention, don't say anything. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. 
Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I've said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. So, let's talk about your start. Now, don't say anything out loud. Think about who you currently live with, who's currently supporting you. Think about where they are on these levels. Think about where they are from the perspective of how they help support you. That's your start. You start, because I'm not sure, how many of you guys in here have jobs? A couple. So you started. But there are some out here that are, you know, they're, you guys are kids, teenagers, young adults. So some of you may not have a job, that's okay, because again, you're still in school. But you start from here. Now, you have your starting point, you have your level. You have your level that you guys said you wanted to achieve. Now, to get from level wherever you are to the level that you want to be, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And that's what we all do, OK? Now, we're going to talk about how to get from level one to six. One to six. Now, level seven, we're not going to talk about level seven. Because to get to level seven, Level seven means that your grandparents, your great grandparents have to be making millions of dollars. And that's what we call old money because it's been generating in your family for a long time. And level seven is a level that's it's very difficult to achieve. Now, you guys may work hard and get to level six so that your grandchildren can get to level seven, which is possible. But you still want to make sure that you still run your race. And so we look and see, okay, well, who's done what? Beyonce. Beyonce's parents were at level two, level three, right? Her parents put her in a lot of different activities so that she can get to a point to where she is now at, let's see. She's now at level six. Let's look at another person, LeBron James. Level one, level two. He then worked hard, and he got to level six. Then we look at Mr. Jeff Bezos. Who knows who Jeff Bezos is? Raise your hand, raise your hand. His parents gave him $245,000 to start Amazon. They were at level four, and they gave him the money he needed to start Amazon. And when he started Amazon, he told, every, he told his parents and everybody who gave him money that there was going to be a 
chance that he was going to fail. He was going to fail. And he did numerous times. But now he's what? One of the world's richest men in the world. And for him, it's still level six because he's first generation. Now, his children and grandchildren will probably get to level seven because that means his money has been in his family for a long time. And so we look at another person. This guy is Chris Gardner, an adult who at one point in time he was doing okay, but then he lost his job. He lost a whole lot of uh, 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 money and ended up becoming homeless, living in bathrooms and cars. But then he then put his work in to get to level six. And I say that to say that it's not, it's, yes, it's going to be some work, but I know you guys can do it. To level up, it takes a lot of work, and we're going to talk about what does that really mean. For me, I started out living on tank branks in um, Grenard Courts, um, and then went through and did my work to get to level six. Now, the question is, how did I get there? Now, each of you guys are in your teenage years, right? So most of you guys are in that yellow, yellow side over there, young adults. You got your point A, where you guys are now. You, this is where, in that range where you guys are now. Then you guys have your goal. Now, how old do you guys want to be when you get to a point where you're making over six figures every year, right? That's the question you want to ask yourself. Where do I, when do I want to do this? And then you work backwards there to figure out how you're going to get there. Let me tell you something, though, before I go off this slide. You guys see how small that yellow side is? That's that yellow side and that red side. That's the smallest amount of time of your life. Enjoy being a kid, because once it's gone, it ain't coming back. Then the rest of your life is being an adult, and what we're not going to call them older, old people. We're going to call them seasoned citizens, okay? Because we want to respect the fact that they put in their time to help us get to where we are. They've done a lot of work in the community, things like that, so you respect the, you respect the people that came before you. So when we talk about leveling up, you guys have your level. Now, let's talk about how I got to my level. So. I started out in cybersecurity working for the Department of Defense in the Army. Um, throughout my years, I worked as a, uh, in the Army as well as what we would call a contractor, where they paid me lots of money to come do the same work um, in my own business. So then they said, hey, Cynthia, you want to come work for us full time? It's like, sure. So I end up working and getting to the highest point in the cybersecurity profession, which is a chief information security officer. I've worked for two different presidents. I've worked for three different uh, generals, and on, uh, as well as being on the FEMA side. And in my journey, I've done everything from securing video game systems, regular computers, cars, missile launchers, drones, tanks, and buildings. And I say all that to say cybersecurity is an awesome profession, and you can do it in literally any industry. And right now, I work for Amazon Web Services. Have anyone in here ever heard of Amazon Web Services? Nope. So about 15 years ago, Amazon.com had a whole lot of computer equipment left over. And they said, we want to do something with it. So some smart guys took that computer equipment and moved it to a different area, and then they allowed people to come and rent their computers. And now, that, and that, that became Amazon Web Services and became the first ever cloud. Now, who in here is familiar with the cloud? Come on now, I know you guys are familiar with the cloud. The cloud is where a lot of companies now put all of their stuff. Netflix runs on there, Microsoft, Google, the rest of them run on there. Oh, this is going to look, hold on, let me back up here. So the cloud is where a lot of people now bring their stuff. And so now I work for Amazon Web Services, where my job is to work with the automotive customers with putting cybersecurity in cars. Cars are now 
moving a lot of their functions inside the vehicle to the cloud so they can drive by themselves. So it may be a future where you guys may not have to drive because now cars are driving by themselves. They're putting more functions, meaning that your car now can park itself and sometimes, you know, just really stay in the lane. So these are different things that are coming across the automotive industry, but they also need cybersecurity people to do what? If my job is to secure something, what am I securing in automotive? Somebody yell it out. What do we want cyber, what do we want cybersecurity for in cars? To make sure it does what? Make sure it drives. Make sure it doesn't hit anybody. Make sure that it does what we want it to do, right? And so when we look at cars, especially now since a lot of cars are going to become electric, we want to make sure that they're protected. And so yes, I love cybersecurity, but I also love talking to people like you. I love talking to kids about robotics, coding, um, being a software developer, and I heard that you guys had Kiara here um, a couple of weeks ago, Kiara Robinson. We recognize her. Okay, she also works for Amazon Web Services. She's a software developer. And so for me, starting out at my point A and trying to say, okay, well, where do I want to go and how do I need to get there? Now, here's what this education pipeline looks like. You start out in elementary school. Elementary school is about nine years from kindergarten to eighth grade. Then you guys are now here in high school. That's your second phase. You guys are gonna continue to level up and graduate from high school. Next part is, if you decide to get you a bachelor, go to college and get your undergraduate degree, that's four and a half years. Then say you wanna get your master's, that's another two and a half years. Say you wanna get your doctorate, that's another three years. That's a lot of time. That's about 13 years to 24 years of your life if you wanna become a doctor. That means by the time you guys are done with school, it's typically around 17 years old to 29 years old. That's the amount of time it takes if you were just to do it back to back. But the point here is that you start at point A and you're shooting for your goal. You want to become, you want to make a certain amount of money. You want to get to a certain point in your life. But what happens is it's not a straight shot. Because sometimes as you guys start today and you move forward, life's still gonna happen. You have your goal and you start where you start, but things can happen. And I'm asking you guys to stay focused on your goal because you can get in a car accident, your parents can pass away, your grandparents can pass away, you could hurt something, different things like that, you can have kids, all these different things will happen to you. All of these different things will happen to you, and this is life. But the thing that you have to keep in front of you is your goal, because it will happen. Sometimes it's gonna kick you in your stomach, you're gonna fall back, and I'm asking you guys to get back up and keep going towards your goal, because life does happen. Now, for me, my life was kinda hard starting at as a little kid, and going through um, elementary school, middle school, I had a lot of bumps and bruises. So for me, um, elementary education, pre-K to eighth grade, for me, took 11 years. Now, it took 11 years because I was sexually abused as a child from the time I was three years old to the time I was 10 years old. And that really does something to a kid, right? That can really mess with you. And so for me, I was kept back in the first grade because they said I couldn't read. They didn't take the time to see if anything was really wrong with me. They just said I couldn't read, so they kept me back in the first grade. Now, I'm dealing with these issues. I'm dealing with depression. I'm dealing with self-mutilation. I'm trying to run away from home. I'm doing all these different things. Then I, my high school, my senior year in high school, I end up getting pregnant. Now, because of all of this, this was life for me. And because of this, when I graduated high school, instead of the four and a half years, it took me seven and a half years to get my degree because I never stopped moving towards my goal. So that's why I ask you guys to make sure you have your goal. 
So then continuing to, to, to push forward, I'm, I was a single mom living on welfare. It was very hard because I'm also in college. I dropped out of college two times, dropped out two times. And I changed my major another two times. When I graduated high school, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. But then I changed my mind and said I wanted to be a math teacher. But then school was too hard, and I said, well, I'm just going to get me an, an associate's degree, give me a two-year degree, and become an accountant. But then that wasn't my passion. That was, that's, that was not what I really wanted to do. So I did change my major and go back to school to get my, doc, my bachelor's in computer science. And I fell in love with IT and cybersecurity. And I say all that to say, as you guys have your starting point, and you have your end goal, I need you to think about what it's going to take for you to get there. This should be your goal. And every day, even now as an adult, I change goals. I got to one of the goals that I wanted, and I built new goals. And what I did was I went home, and I put my goal, I, I cut out some magazine articles, and put, put all of my goals on a poster board, and I put it beside my bed. Now, every morning that I wake up, I see my goals. And I do that because even though I love my job, sometimes it's just hard to get up in the morning. Raise your hand if you still, if sometimes it just get hard for you guys to get up in the morning. It's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. But what I want you to do is find out what it takes for you to get to your goal. And I want you to make your own, what we call, in, from an adult perspective, we call them vision boards. Some people make their vision boards and put them beside their bed. They put them in their kitchen. They put them in their bathroom. Because sometimes life can just be hard. And you need that motivation to push forward. And nobody, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that life is going to be easy. Because life is what we call just life. Life be lifing. That's what we and my best friends say. Life be lifing. Because it, there are things that does happen. Because one of the things that you cannot control is other people. But what you can 100% control is your actions and how you respond to people. Okay? So when we look at what it takes to get to our goal, for me, I put a lot of my, I put all of my story in my book, Letters to My Brown Girls. Four Phases to a Liberated Life Beyond Childhood Sexual Abuse. And I did that because I know how hard it is for adults to get past a lot of the stuff that they went through as a child. So I put it in a book to help other brown women go through that. But the book can be applied to anyone. I've actually had men ask me, hey, when are you going to write a book for men? Because boys do get ab abused too. And these are things, when, that, when those kind of things happen to you in your life, you want to find people to kind of help you make it through it. Because believe it or not, you are not alone in your journey. This is not just about, you know, hey, get up, go to school, come home. Get up, go to school, come home. It's so much more to life, and it's so much more fun. So I ask you to think about what is your level? What is the level that you guys want to get to? Because again, that's your goal. Now, the next question is, well, Dr. Sutherland, how do I get there? Well, we talked about the degrees, but let me tell you what it really takes. Who in here have been told that if you work real hard, everything will happen for you? If you work real hard, you'll get what you want. Who who been told that? I'm going to tell you right now, that's a lie. It's a straight up lie. They say, oh, all you got to do is hard, work hard. No, it's not. That's a lie. I'm going to tell you. These are the three parts that it takes for you to be successful. It's about you, your actions, and your squad. You, your actions, and your squad. What's the largest part on here that contributes to you being successful? Your squad, the people you hang out with. Now, I'm going to break it down a little bit more. Now, hopefully it's not too overwhelming, but here it is. So, your squad, those are your money makers and your tail waggers. Now, when people say, oh, you go to school, get a good education, you'll be successful. You see how 
small that part is, that's 8% of being successful. Small part, small part. You get your degrees, you get your diplomas, and now what? Well, I'm gonna tell you that getting your education and getting your skills is not just about getting your education and getting your skills while you're here at high school. See, the other part is learning how to use your voice, meaning learning how to talk to people, learning how to be respectful, because you can, as they say, you catch more flies with honey. Being nicer means that you're inviting people to be nicer to you. And when they're talking to you, they get to know you and the real you, the value that you bring to them. And then you also have to know how to stand up for yourself. Because if someone is doing you dirty at work, what you gonna do, just sit there and take it? You have to learn how to stand up for yourself. And then the other part is your value to you now, and your value to an organization. If I'm a football coach, and I'm looking for a quarterback, Will I put a wide receiver in that position? Would I? Why not? Because of how he plays. He doesn't have the skills to be a quarterback. He's a wide receiver. So when a job, when a company is looking to hire you, they're looking to hire you based on the skills you bring, based on the value that you bring to what they need you for. So if someone tells you no, you, we, we, we don't need you right now, Maybe that's just no for right now. So you go find a company, you go find an organization that values you for who you are. And then the whole squad, your squad. Now, all of you guys are in high school. Your squad, your money makers, your tail waggers, you guys have friends. Now, if you are at a level two and you're trying to get to a level six, would you ask somebody at a level one to help you? No, you wouldn't. They ain't never been there. How are they gonna help you get there? So when you're looking at your teachers, your principals, your guidance counselors, they are all at their levels above you guys when it comes to career, money, whatever. If you need assistance with getting up there to, to level up, these are the people you need to talk to. Because if you got a bunch of broke friends, are you gonna talk to them about how to help you make money? If they don't, if they, like, how does that work? Now, if you have a bunch of smart friends, that's a different story. See, for me, I figured out when I was in the ninth grade, I was hanging out with the wrong type of people. The people that I, were, I was hanging out with, I grew up with, but I realized our values didn't line up. And I knew that if I was going to be successful, I needed to start hanging out with a different type of people. And one of the things I've, I've, I kind of live by is when they say you're the smartest one in, in your group, then you need to find another group. Because if you guys are, again, hanging with someone that's at a different level mature, maturity-wise, I'll just say maturity-wise. Because again, you guys are all kids, and I'm not gonna quit calling you young adults, and you're trying to level up. So the most important thing for you guys to be access, successful would be identifying who, the, who are the people that help you get to the level that you want. Who are the, what are the relationships that you want to create to help you level up? And for me, my relationships included friends who were smarter than me, my principals, my guidance counselors, and my teachers. So when I was struggling in the morning or struggling having a real bad day coming to school, those are the people I went to to help motivate me to continue to move forward. And so for me, my success to get to the Department of Defense level and become a level six, honestly, it was about all the people that I knew. It was about the relationships that I had. And so I say all that to say, what it takes to be successful is not just about school. It's also about your voice, your image, the people you talk to, the people you interact with. And so continue to find people to help you level up. Because how many of you in here chose level six? Raise your hand. <laughs> and that's okay. So you wanna find the people to kinda help you get your knowledge up. 
You want to find the people that help you with relationship, relationship building, because we had a situation where we hired, um, when I was in the Department of Defense, we hired a 16-year-old sophomore from college. She was 16 in her second year of college. Now, she was a brilliant software developer. She was real good at coding, but she did not know how to create relationships and she used the wrong, wrong tone with people. She called the adults on her team stupid. She told them that their projects was crap and that she should be working directly for the Secretary of Defense. Really? Now, because she ruined her relationships with her coworkers, her teammates, they had her fired. Because she was great at, she was very smart, she could do the job, it's just that it's not about just doing the job and being smart. It's also about the team that you work for, the, work, the team that you work on, and how you treat people. Then we had, I remember another scenario um, where there was a young girl who applied to Harvard. She had the highest GPA in her, in her class, and they rejected her. And when we found out why she was rejected, she was rejected because she had great grades, but she didn't have her letters of recommendation. She didn't really know anyone to give her references. She did not participate in any extracurricular activities, meaning that she didn't volunteer anywhere. She didn't help at the Boys and Girls Club. She didn't help at the church. She didn't have any uh, club activities in high school. She didn't play any sports. And she thought she was just gonna do it by getting good grades. And I'm here to tell you guys, it's way more than just about getting good grades if you wanna be successful. Now, I'm gonna leave the rest of the session open for questions to see if anyone have any questions about me, my career, or any other scenario. So, um, where's the mic? Talk. <laughs> you took it way back there. All right, is there anyone who has any questions about high school, any questions about college, or any questions about the job or cybersecurity? Raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay, we got one in the back. Um, how did you get to where you are now? Can you stand up? Oh, we'll sit down. I understand if you don't want to stand up. <laughs> I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> um. <laughs> how, how did I, how did I, you can sit down, sweetie. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, you can sit down. I know, so what was your question? Like, how did you get to where you are now, and like, was it hard or easy for you once you like, known what you were doing? You didn't hear my question. Yes, that's what, uh, uh, I, heard your, I heard some of your classmates say, she just explained it, bro. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I, I started out at level two, level one, so what I did was I found the profession that I wanted to get in, and this is for all of you. When you find the profession that you want, you identify what are the skills and knowledge that you need to have. So when I wanted to get into cybersecurity and like officially get into it, I uh, went to see what is the certification that I need. And it says, well, to get into cybersecurity, you need the security plus. And then I was like, well, what's the end state? And they said, well, the end state is the CISSP. And I was like, well, I don't want this. I want this because I want my money. Because they said that if I get this, I can start out making $100,000 a year working for anybody. So who wouldn't want that certification, right? So I studied for that certification. That certification was six hours long. And it took $500 to take that test and pass it. Now, $500 to take and pass a test that will make me $100,000. Who would, and who would take that? 500 to make 100,000? Wouldn't you wanna take, let me go ahead and get my $500.
because now I know what I need to do to get to that point. And that's the same with any profession. There's lawyers, you gotta get your, your, your uh, Juris Doctorate degree. There are accountants, there's digital forensics people. There are all of these jobs. So I say, find the career that you like, identify what the certification or degree is, and then say, I'm gonna get that. And then you do what you need to do to get it. Any other questions? Yes. Sure, so um, for me, like I said earlier, I was a teenage mom. So for me, college, um, I had to take out student loans to pay for school. And I took out my student loans. I started student loans out of high school. Like I said, life happened. So I had to drop out and come back, drop out and come back. So the student loans did add up, but now I have a job where I can pay those student loans back. And it was all worth it because it wasn't just about the degree. It also exposed me to a lot of people that I now created relationships uh, with. And so if I need different things, I can go to these people and ask them, hey, can you help me with this? Hey, can you show me how to do this? And that's really for me is, is more value than, than the student loans. Oh, I'm still paying, <laughs> I'm still paying. And guess what, I'm okay with that because what I've done is I've created that level for my children so that I can make pay for them to go to college. So now they're not in the situation that I was in. So I'm okay with that. Any other questions? We have one back here, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> how was I? I how was you mentally doing during the process of like what you're doing now? I'm sorry, say that again, sweetie. How was you mentally doing during the process? How was I what? How was you mentally? Oh, mentally. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> mentally, let me go back to a slide to kind of show you what that looked like. So for me, as a young person, life was kind of depressing for me. Because remember, I was going through my sexual abuse phase, and once it stopped, I was in like elementary school. And then at that point, it was really just going through and learning how to manage depression. And one of the things that I've learned as an adult as a, and as a parent, that as a child, as a young adult, your brain continues to change. A lot of you guys are going through puberty right now because your body is growing and that's normal. So your emotions will change, your drive will change, your thoughts will change, and that's normal. When learning how to deal with depression and mental health issues, the best thing that you can do is get you a squad that can help you go and grow through it. And so my squad included my guidance counselor once I realized how important they were. My squad included my guidance counselor, my principal, and my, some of my teachers. And that's what helped me get through high school because high school was hard. And like I said, with all of the emotions and thoughts that you guys are going through, it's expected. And so a lot of teachers are very well versed in learning how to manage your emotions, learning how to manage the situations that you guys are going through. So for me, it was my school staff. And you know, one of the things I talked about earlier was the money makers and the tail waggers in a organization. In the school, in a school, who are the money makers? Who make the money in the schools from, a, from an occupation perspective? Is it the janitor? Is it the front office staff? Or is it the teachers and the principals? The teachers and the principals, guys. <laughs> they're here giving you guys education and skills. They're, they're like some of the most valuable people you guys can get to know because they're giving you knowledge that you're not gonna get in other places or can't get in other places. 
So having relationships with them where they know how to not just give you guys the knowledge and skills, but they also know how to help you guys navigate your emotions. And teenage years is a, is, is a hard time. So use them wisely. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Yes. So when I, when I came into the government, I first was hired on to be the security operations branch chief for the Secretary of Defense. And in that role, my job was to monitor all of the computers that he used to accomplish and defend this country. That was my role. But in that time, the first six months that I was in that position, number one, I had a couple of things that I had to overcome. Number one, I was a female in a male-dominated industry. And I'm gonna keep it real, when you're a female going into a male-dominated industry, there are a lot of biases that you have to overcome when dealing with people who feel offended or intimidated by you being there. And it happens. As I'm not gonna sit here and say it's easier for, for women or for girls, no, it's sometimes it's harder for girls, depending on the profession that you want to go into. And that's one of the reasons why they're highlighting, I forgot Jalen Hurts, sports agent. Um, you know, who in here know who Jalen Hurts is? A couple of you guys. Quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. His sports agent was a woman. She's a sports agent in a male-dominated field. So for her to be able to help him navigate his football career, that's amazing. And even for me to navigate the cybersecurity field within the Department of Defense, it took a lot of challenges. I had this one guy who literally wanted to fight me in the Pentagon because I told him that he couldn't use the computer the way he wanted to. He came up 6'2", came up to me, how dare you touch my computer? How, who do you think you are? And I had to take a step back, control my emotions, because I envisioned me fighting him and the Pentagon police taking all of us out. Then I lose my job, I lose my career, I lose everything that I own because I didn't know how to control my emotions at that one point in time. And so I had to step back, control myself, talked to him in a respectful manner, and then I left. And then later his boss came back and asked me, do you want me to fire him because he created a hostile work environment? I said, no, maybe he just had a bad day yesterday at home. All I need you to do is just talk to him. And me and that guy ended up becoming the bestest of friends because I understood that he was, going, that he was possibly going through something. So for me, navigating those waters in the Department of Defense was a challenge. But I still had my goal in front of me. I knew what I wanted to do. And I just stuck to it because again, like I said, life will kick you in the gut, things will happen, and the one thing that you can only control 100% is how you respond to others. Is there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Obama and Trump. Um, there was a, did I ever meet either one of them? I've been in meetings with them, but never met any of them. I met First Lady Michelle Obama, but um, she's not the president. But she was a, a mentor, uh, someone, uh, I'll say someone who inspired me. So it was great to kind of, to, to meet her. But I never met any one of them, I just like were in meetings with them. Um, we had situations where in 2015, my network was hacked. Let me tell you how it happened. I sit here and I secured my, my computers. I had the best, best, best systems in the entire Pentagon. We were doing really well. We had put all the security, place, security uh, processes in place and then my network got hacked. How did it get hacked? I had three people, three users that clicked on links from people they didn't even know. And when they clicked on those links, that malware, the software went rampant throughout their computers and started connecting to other computers, and it was infecting all the other computers, and we literally had to chop 
our network off of the internet because these, pe because these people clicked three links. And when it happened, I had to make my staff work 24 by seven shifts. They were coming in working 12 hours rotation to clean up our computers so that we can get the chairman and the secretary back online to communicate to the rest of the world. We were offline for a whole month, and that month cost us $9.6 million because three people clicked on a link. After we had told them, do not click on links from people you, know, people you don't know. If you know someone that sent you a link, call them first and ask, hey, did you send this link to us? And they'll let you know, yes, I sent it. But if they didn't, then don't click on it because it'll take your computer down. Now you see a lot of uh, businesses getting ransomware attacks. Hackers are sending their people links and their people are clicking on the links. And when they click on that link, it basically encrypts all of their folders and they can't even operate. So that's why we talk to people about cybersecurity because we wanna make sure they understand, oh, it may just be a link to you, but to your IT department, your cybersecurity department, to your business, for your network to get hacked, that, that's a lot of money and time that could have been avoided if you just don't click on those links. Now, any, any question, any other questions? Yes, sir. So they were not arrested, they were not fined. What happened was they had to go back through training um, because yes, it did cost, cost a lot of money, um, but there were some policies in place for people like that who were first time offenders. But trust, we did watch them afterwards. So they did have to go through training. The Secretary of Defense ordered me to develop a training that the entire Pentagon IT staff had to take um, within two weeks. And so I did my first ever live video, uh, um, live, t uh, live video taping um, to, um, in the Pentagon Auditorium to everyone about how important it is to not click on links. <laughs> and that crowd was about uh, 2,500 in the auditorium and then another 10,000 on online. So it was a very uh, stressful moment, but we got through it. We got through it. So, any other questions? Sure, sure. So, who in here knows what FEMA is? Or even heard of FEMA? Okay. So, FEMA is what we, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Their job is to handle and provide for American people whenever we have an emergency. That could be forest fires, that can be hurricanes, that can be COVID. So when COVID happened, FEMA was responsible for uh, collecting and providing people with personal protection equipment, PPE, the mask and the gloves and everything to help protect the American people. And so when I started working at FEMA, we started having trouble with finding that type of equipment because we had shut down all of our shipping and most of our stuff came from overseas. And so we were struggling to find the equipment. Um, once we did get it, we gave it to, you know, to everyone. Um, then we had um, COVID uh, vaccination, right? So the vaccination came out. We had to make sure that you know, all the right people were getting their vaccinations. And then we had the COVID funeral assistance. Now, COVID funeral assistance program was real big because a lot of people died from COVID and a lot of people didn't have life insurance. And so FEMA worked with the Homeland Security and the president to find money to give to people whose parents or whose family members died from COVID. And that money paid for the, their funeral expenses. Um, I know the first six months we gave out $2 billion in COVID funeral assistance money. That's huge, right? Because people needed that money to bury or to even repay for some of the expenses that they had to pay because their family members died from COVID. And another thing about FEMA is that FEMA does have 
a living assistance program that whenever an American has struggles or dies from a natural disaster, they have a program where you can go online to submit your information to help you get money back from the expenses that you may have lost from a natural disaster. So um, my role at FEMA was to ensure that the money that we gave, that $2.6 billion that we gave out, my role was to make sure that it was sent to the people in a secure manner. The people who was given the money, I had to, mo I had to check their security backgrounds, make sure that they had some cybersecurity practice in place so that they can um, deliver that money as well. So that was my role at FEMA. Um, any other questions? Yes, yes. Did becoming a teen mom affect my focus academically? Is that, oh, my goals? Um, yes, it did. Um, originally, I said I wanted to become an electrical engineer. But then, when I got pregnant, life changed, and I needed to be able to provide, provide for my son. So at that point in time, I needed to figure out how can I get money as quick as possible without having to do a full four-year degree. So I decided to do a two-year degree instead. But then, like I said, life happens. I got in a car wreck, and some, more, uh, and some other things happened where I kind of had to step back and then reassess what life looked like for me. And then I made a decision to join the Army. When I got into the Army, I learned more skills. They provide, they paid me um, because I had a very high uh, testing score, the ASVAB testing score. They gave me $8,000 just to sign on and come work for them. And so I took the $8,000, went into the Army, got an education, got some certifications out of it, and some experience. And that's what helped set me up to where I am now. Did that answer your question, sweetie? Okay, any other questions? No? Awesome. All right, Hyson. No, thank you guys, thank you so much. Thank you guys, appreciate it. <laughs> hey, what's up? I made it to CES 2023 and there's so much amazing tech that I can't wait to show you. We have a lot to see, so sit back, relax, and let's check it out. Robot lawnmowers are kind of getting crazy, and this one from EcoFlow really stood out. You can actually attach a bag on the back to sweep or collect leaves in your yard. Imagine driving through your neighborhood and seeing this thing doing yard work. It has an app so you can control it and set virtual boundaries, plus some sensors in the front to avoid obstacles. It even has 4G and an eSIM built in if it gets out of Wi-Fi range. Mowing the lawn could actually be fun with the EcoFlow blade. I mean, a robot chopping things with a blade in front of your house? What could go wrong? So, you've heard of smoke detectors, but what about fire detectors? This new product immediately detects a small flame, then notifies you with a push notification and an alarm beeping. <laughs> They say this is perfect for a kid's room, so if you have a pyromaniac who plays with matches, well, you should probably hide those matches and then get this. This surprised me and is one of my favorite things from CES. It's just so fast and accurate. 